is good? All the time. Please stand for number 579. It is Lane's favorite song, Shine Through the Shine. We'll do all three verses. Out there running. 
So I had to know my own weakness, and I, I went ahead and we put the uh, tinting on the windows so the pastor wouldn't be uh, distracted. So the fact that you have made a decision to be inside here today with us, worshiping God, singing his praises, yielding ourselves to his leading, that already says a lot about you, and I appreciate you coming in and being with us this morning. Uh, so I just want to, uh, again, thank you for being here. Of all the places that you could be, you chose to come here today. I believe it's where God would have you to be, and, and uh, we will try and uh, uh, make this a worthwhile time uh, for you. We have some announcements about uh, what's going on in the life of our church. Uh, if we can get the next slide, please. Uh, we have a, a children's program. Uh, I call it Sunday School if you want at uh, 10 a.m. and then we roll into uh, what we would probably call Children's Church at uh, 11 a.m. We uh, tend to draw from uh, the Awana curriculum. Uh, it uh, works really well for us. It gets the kids engaged with the Word of God and putting it into practice. So uh, we'll come around in a few minutes. It will be time for Children's Church. If the kids want to go off with our uh, Children's Church team, uh, that's fine if they want to stay with mom or dad, that's uh, equally good. Uh, next slide. Uh, VBS Spark Studio uh, is our training. Maria, right, it's going to be the 17th, is that correct? Okay, that'll be the week following our, uh, we'll have the picnic and baptism on the 10th, and then on the 17th will be that. Do you want to mention anything about that? Uh, um, no, just keep us in prayers. Okay. Now, when she says 50 kids, I've done this a time or two, and I love VBS. It's probably the uh, the ministry that I can uh, most readily get behind. But what makes it truly awesome is. If we have 50 kids, how many adult volunteers do you suppose we ideally need? 100. <laughs> well, 100 would be, that That would be mind-blowing. I don't know what we would do with 100. Usually we go for a one-for-one -one exchange. One, one uh, adult leader. And it's not all just going to be, you know, uh, following the same clutch of kids around all day long. We have different uh, activities during uh, uh, vacation, Bible school, everything from uh, song and worship to uh, uh, Bible study, to recreation, uh, snack time, missions time. So there's a lot of activity. Uh, what I'm getting at is if you will make the time, we will make it worth it. If you will make the time to come and engage, we will make sure that that time is invested uh, firmly in the kingdom of God. So please consider that. Uh, it's the week of August 14th, I believe. 15th? 15th to the 9th. If they came on the 14th, that would be Sunday, though, and they get to stay. <laughs> so uh, we can throw some cots out to chairs or something. Uh, so, yeah, come on the, the week of the 15th. Um, and then uh, the following Saturday, I think, is going to be the missions conference. We probably don't have a, uh, a slide for that up yet. Uh, but uh, that's going to be down at the SAFE. Uh, so there's a, a lot going on uh, uh, that time. Uh, the training, if, if you're contemplating uh, uh, coming, uh, please come to the training so that, that'll make sure when you arrive uh, you're kind of uh, um, tuned into what, uh, what will be going on. Uh, next slide. Uh, letters from jail, we need to replace that. It is no longer the letters from jail, but it is the one, two, three, four faces of Jesus Christ. Now I've gotten their attention, haven't I? <laughs> what we see is we have four gospel accounts, uh, historical narratives of the life and ministry of our Savior Jesus Christ. And each one comes from a, a different perspective. It presents a different facet of Jesus' nature. And so we will be looking at those uh, over the course of the next few weeks. We are beginning tonight to, in Mark's Gospel, where we see uh, uh, Jesus as the perfect servant of God. So I encourage you to come at five. I guarantee you will learn something, and uh, it will be something that is relevant to uh, your life here and now. So five o'clock. Next slide. Uh,
church council is Tuesday night. Tuesday night's church council. Um, I was going to mention, I don't know what it was, but it's really important. So uh, pray for pastor. Uh, please come uh, if you are a ministry leader. That will be uh, important. Also, we are in the, uh, we are preparation. Uh, August is when we have our uh, vision night and we install ministry leaders. So if uh, the Lord is laying upon your heart that it's time to move out of the, uh, the pews and uh, onto the ministry field, then uh, let us know and uh, we will do our best to uh, make sure that uh, we have a, uh, a place on the ministry team for, for you and, and uh, the calling of the Lord is placed back in heart. Uh, next slide. Uh, Man Cave Ministries. I don't have uh, my go-to guy is normally Chris. We're here on, uh, uh, I think he's uh, in, where's the Spencer's? Did I lose my Spencer's? I lost my Spencer's. Okay, uh, at any rate, uh, we're here uh, Friday nights at 7 p.m. There is a uh, child care at that time. It is a, a, a time of uh, equipping and fellowship uh, for the, uh, uh, the men of God, so we encourage you to come. Next slide. Uh, I'll let somebody else talk about women's garden. Somebody else talk about women's garden. Um, we will be meeting on Friday night. We are working on the power of prayer and trusting in the sovereignty of the Lord. Um, in June, July 1st, which is upcoming, our meeting will be the last weekly before we go into the bi-weekly for the summer. Okay. The weeklies will resume September. Okay, very good. All right, so everybody got that? Okay, if not, then just pretend like you did, and then uh, we'll make that. Uh, next slide. Simple Church, Wednesday nights, singing, preaching, and pray. Uh, next slide. Uh, music and drama. I think we have drama uh, tonight, don't we, today? No drama? So I realized that I couldn't compete with the graduation party today. <laughs> yeah. So no practice uh, today. We're moving into next week. And then obviously you'll practice July 10th since we'll be at Park. Okay. Do we have a uh, slide for the graduation party there? It's not a good time. Uh, it's, it's in two, but you can talk about it. We'll skip it. Oh, that's all right. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll get to it. Uh, next slide. Uh, flea market. Uh, next one's the 16th. Uh, that um, is it's not really a fundraiser. Uh, we invest money in that. It's an opportunity to uh, uh, draw the uh, community on campus. Uh, and it both halves of the equation, we have vendors who come and uh, uh, present uh, either uh, crafts or uh, other uh, goods that they have for sale, as well as uh, community members who come looking for a bargain. So it's a great opportunity to uh, minister to the community, uh, uh, have spiritual conversations, and have people uh, no longer drive by the way. I wonder what they do there. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the nature of that. We encourage you to come and uh, be a part. Next slide. You are invited. Oh, your wife did this, didn't she? She did. Okay. Yeah. That's a uh, tiny little writing. I can see that. Uh, it's our graduation party today. Uh, we have hopefully, uh, is the Seth coming? Or? All right. So uh, we have uh, uh, three uh, uh, young folks that uh, are graduating high school and going off on uh, whatever their particular next step will be. We'd like to celebrate that here. Uh, and uh, so that's what's going on. The food is already provided. Uh, Lord willing, uh, after uh, I get done up here this morning, I'll walk back, hit the button, and we will inflate the bounce house for the kids. Uh, um, so uh, if you would stay and help us to celebrate, uh, we'll try to turn your kids back to you uh, in one piece. And uh, life will be uh, joyful. Uh, next slide. Operation Christmas Child. Uh, the back to school sales are uh, coming on now. Uh, Operation Christmas Child, if you're not familiar uh, with it, think of one of those little plastic shoe boxes filled with uh, school supplies, uh, uh, toiletries, um, uh, hopefully a cool toy, uh, a soccer ball, and uh, a pump for inflating. We'll fit in uh, one of those quite well and still leave room for other things. We put them all together. We combine them with other uh, uh, churches in the uh, Hudson, Hudson Valley, and then we uh, send them off to uh, uh, more remote uh, parts of the, uh, the world. It's a great ministry. Uh, 
we're going to be talking about it a lot as we roll into the fall, but uh, right now is the time to get stuff on the cheap. So uh, when you see uh, the pencils and the paper and the crayons and like that, uh, pick up uh, one or two of them and then uh, that'll be part of our, uh, our, our ministry there. Next slide. Uh, ID University, we're on summer break, see you in the fall. Next slide. Uh, Deacon of the Week is da -da 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 -da, Beverly. And uh, Sandra and John will be uh, receiving the uh, offering today. So I will yield the platform to Beverly.
<laughs> almost. We're almost time. Any kids? Any kids at all? Big kids, little kids, shiny kids, grinding kids. What? You got a medal? Nice. Yeah? <laughs> Everybody in our country, their families came from some other country. Does that make sense? Yeah, they came here from, from all over the world. Now, some people were still here at the very beginning. We call those indigenous peoples, first peoples. But for the most part, we all came here from somewhere else. And sometimes when you go from one country to another country, it's a little hard to get used to the culture. And there is a story about this family. They did exactly that. They came here from another country and they tried their best to, to fit in, to do the things that they saw other people doing and to uh, in, enjoy the, uh, the place as others did. And one of the things that they had is when they first got here, uh, they were always very dependent on riding the bus, taking taxis, taking the train. They had no car of their own. So they, they worked really hard, they saved up their money, and they bought the best car that they could afford. And to them, it was a prized possession. They would frequently uh, be seen out in their driveway washing it, kind of uh, uh, putting some armor all on the tires, you know, waxing it, keeping the windshields shiny clean and all of that. And on Sundays, they would all get dressed up in their very nice clothes, and they would go out and they would sit in the car. That's what they did. They just went out and they sat in the car. They never turned the motor on. They never listened to the radio. They never uh, uh, rolled down the power windows. They just sat there for a long period of time. And when they had enough sitting in the car, then they went back in the house and they went about what they were doing. Well, the neighbors thought this was pretty odd. And they're like, well, why is it that you don't drive your car? They asked them, why you have such a nice car? You, you, work so hard to get it, you keep it so uh, immaculately clean, and they're like, no, we're good. We, we just really like having our car, and we really don't ever intend to drive it. Perhaps we'll pass it down from generation to generation. That will be for our children to decide, but meanwhile, none of us will ever drive this car. Now, if those people were your neighbors, would that seem like the best thing to do with a, a shiny new car? What do you think? Going to church on Sunday would be a, a good alternative. But the point is, is they had something very precious that was going unused. It wasn't being used what it was made for. And a lot of us are in a similar situation. We have salvation in Jesus Christ, which was purchased for us at a very great cost, at the life of Jesus himself something very precious which has been given to us. We can't earn it, we don't deserve it, but it was entrusted to us. But yet a lot of us, I, I'm question, Q and A time's done. Okay. Uh, but a lot of us don't do anything with that salvation. We don't really become very much like Jesus, like he taught us to. We don't go out and tell others about Jesus as he instructed us to. We're not being transformed from citizens of this world into citizens of heaven. And yet we fully expect to go to heaven one day and to spend all of our time with a Jesus that we never got to know down here on earth. It's like owning a car, shining it up every week, but never driving it. What Jesus told his disciples to do is to go out and drive that thing. Let others see you. Let others hear about Him because they saw Him in you. And that's why we have things like Sunday school. We worship together. We serve our community together so that that way other folks will get to know Jesus the way you do. So, yes, sir? Um, if, if, the, if those people never use that car, then, then everything will get messy. Like if they put the brakes on the wheels, uh -huh. if Just they like Just like not using our faith, then, everything gets rusty. Then, They probably could, couldn't they? Hopefully tiny animals so they won't be bothered. Okay. 
So, we've got some guys who are totally driving their car. Yeah, and they're on the video. Would you like to see the video of the people who are driving their car up fake? Yeah. All right. Lay it on us, Abraham. I was working for a local television station as a broadcast news reporter.
Heavenly Father, we are created in your image. We share your spirit. And we desire, Father God, to likewise share your values, your priorities, to love what you love, and to do what you do. We pray, Father God, that this offering is a stepping stone to the next day, and then to the next and to the next. And as we sacrificially give, you bless and multiply, and others join us on this journey. We pray, Father God, that a mighty multitude will stand before you on that great welcoming day. As we hear you say, well done, good and faithful servants. As we pray in Jesus' name. Bill Bright. I don't know if uh, many of you know the name. Uh, he hasn't been uh, in uh, the headlines for quite some time now. But Bill Bright uh, was an outlier and he became well known for founding an organization called Campus Crusade for Christ. And in an interview, he told about his experience as a Christian, as a young man of faith, and a unique calling that God had placed upon his heart. He said, I can remember that as a young believer, I felt impressed by God to call on a specific man who was the CEO of one of the great Fortune 500 companies. God told him to, like, go call on this guy. And he says, as presumptuous as it sounds, the man was actually very responsive and agreed to see me. So I asked for 15 minutes of his personal time. I arrived at the big building, which was his company headquarters. I was ushered up to a beautiful office. And the room was there immaculately clean, well organized, well decorated, and he had a beautiful desk without a single thing on it. I feel guilty when I read that. And the man was sitting behind uh, uh, his desk. He said, well, son, what can I do for you? Well, sir, thank you for seeing me today. I've come to talk to you about your relationship to Jesus Christ. On the surface, you would expect that such a man in such a position, having graciously given up 15 minutes to a young man that he knew nothing about, at that point from the onset of the conversation, he would have like pressed the button under his desk and had some security usher the young man back out. But he said, Sir, I've come to talk to you about your relationship with Jesus Christ. And at that point, instead of having him thrown out of the building, tears came to the corners of the man's eyes. And he put his head down on his desk and he began to weep. He told me that at the age of eight, he had become a believer, follower of Jesus Christ. He had become so ambitious, however, that he no longer had time for God or the things of God. And even though he had become remarkably successful, hugely rich and famous, he hadn't been in church in over 30 years, and he felt a void, an 
emptiness. And he longed for that earlier experience with God. The man told me, God sent you, young man. He sent you to help me. And because of you, I'll be in church Sunday morning. Now I understand that Bill Bright is an outlier. Even as an adolescent, he knew what he believed, why he believed it, and what it meant to his life. He wasn't content to merely sit on the bench and watch the kingdom of God play out before him. No, he knew his place was down on the field. And he intended to put into practice the teachings of Christ Jesus, no matter what the personal cost. He would risk it all. You'll meet very few people that are like Bill Bright, of any age. And such faith, I would say, is rarely evident, whether you are outside church or inside. We just do not see it. When we look at much of the world's condition, we see that each day, rather than the world becoming more like the kingdom of God, the church is becoming more like the world. And so we have this conundrum which we must address. Because the reality has always been a concern. There are always those who like the idea of Jesus far more than they liked being a follower of Jesus. They wanted salvation without sacrifice. And if Jesus was willing to do all the sacrifice, so much more the better. Of course, this has never been the teachings of Christ or the way of Christ, but it's how we've changed the message to fit and accommodate our, our contemporary culture. In the last 2,000 years, we have seen a steady eroding of the foundations of faith upon which the church is built. To the point now that it is very difficult just by following a man or a woman of faith around to know for, uh, for real whether they are a believer or not. Very difficult to tell. And a lot of it we would say, well, that's just the person. When they leave, when they get in the car, when they go home, when they go to the job, when they go to the marketplace, the school. No, it's here. Here is where the breakdown is occurring. When we ask very little of our church members, when we expect very little evidence of the transformation that only the Holy Spirit can do. When sacrifice is paid for in dollar bills. There was a time when the church, following Jesus' examples, would say, you folks over here, we are sending you. Remember, Jesus said to the fishermen, what? Drop your nets. I will make you fisher, uh, fishers of men. He told the tax collectors, leave your booths. Follow me. I will show you what true riches look like. He told people, abandon your former way of life, your former way of living, and enter the kingdom of God. Churches, including Ridgecrest, have rarely made such demands on those who would be Christ's followers. Matter of fact, we rarely even talk about such nonsensical ideas of leaving a profession at which you are successful, at leaving a home in which you are comfortable, at leaving friends and family to embark upon a mission for the kingdom of God. Who on earth would expect such nonsense? Jesus. What we're going to see, though, is that we do have a model of such faith and faithfulness. And if we will only open the pages of Scripture, it will fairly leap out at us. And I think compel us
to consider what is that next step? What is the contemporary example of abandoning the nets? What is the contemporary example of leaving the booths, leaving the homes? How do we act that out in real time in, in 2022 New York State? Because if we are unwilling to even consider that possibility, that necessity, what are we doing? Our text today comes from Acts chapter 15. I'm going to share a single verse with you, verse 22. Acts 15, 22, the Word of God says that it seemed good to the apostles, and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among, uh, among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. So they sent Judas called Barsabbas and Silas were leading men among the brothers. So what we have here is we have a church, a church in a remote place called Antioch. Antioch, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, uh, church history, uh, was an incubator for Christianity. It is the place where followers of, of Christ Jesus were first called what? Christians. So Antioch was not a place devoid of faith, and it was also not monolithic in, in its faith. As it was a very diverse city, people oftentimes approached their Christian faith from whatever their former backdrop was. We see that a lot in the world around us today. And so this caused tension amongst the believers. There was a need to differentiate what was in agreement with the teachings of Christ and what was not. And so to settle this, the church in Jerusalem grabbed a handful of guys that were known to be faithful followers of Jesus and also faithful messengers of the gospel and sent them to Antioch. And this became a pattern for the churches around the Greco-Roman Empire from that point forward. Churches were known not for building these huge buildings and, and erecting large monuments to their own edification. They were known for building up people and sending them out. You can walk down the streets of Jerusalem or Antioch or even Rome in its day and nobody would be able to point to a building and say, well, that's the church. The church was the people who gathered together at, and they heard the apostles' teachings they devoted themselves to uh, the reading of scripture and prayer. The church were the ones who were sent out. We need, we must, the world needs us to become a sending body once again. We can look at all the horrific examples of things going wrong in our culture and around the world. And if you do the math, there is only one thing that is going to save us from ourselves, and that is the church becoming the church once again. Armed with the gospel, driven by a fervent, zealous faith in Jesus Christ. The people of the church going into the world and bringing a peace which passes all understanding. But we've got to be willing. We've got to be willing to send. We have to be willing to be sent. We have to be willing not only to be called, but devoted to, to the equipping and the going. And this is not a new concept. It's just something we don't see in Western culture very much. Because we tend to do with this what we've done with just about everything else. Well, we'll give it over to the experts. Those people who really know their stuff. I, I, I heard a, uh, a missionary one time uh, up in Alaska. We were pastoring there. And he was talking about his, how it is that he came to, to be a, a missionary uh, out in the villages. And he says, 
Well, you know, when I was in seminary, I never thought of myself as one of those super saints. And I'm like, what? Yeah, you know, the missionaries. So even he had become intoxicated by this description that there were those of us who were Christ followers who were in the very minority, the pointy edge of the, the spear, so to speak. And those were the ones who were called better. Those were the ones who were sent. Those were the ones who were uh, equipped to do the heavy lifting in the kingdom of God. And it was the rest of, I don't know, maybe what he expected us to do was to applaud or something. Yeah, go oh, you. We'll be here praying for you. No. The church, whenever there is a problem that is presented in the pages of Scripture, it is the church that is called to respond. Now, they might have their identifiable uh, leaders in that organization, but if you read the text, if you study the Scriptures, you see that it was not a singular act by a lone individual. It was the church. It was the church that Jesus said he would build and batter down the very gates of hell to set the captives free. And we have not been about the Lord's business. It is time for us to become a sending body again. So that from the time that our kids are in the nursery to when we have their graduation in the fellowship hall, they understand that they are being equipped to go into a world that is dark with spiritual warfare to bring salt and light to those who are lost and in need of salvation. We have a sending God. Remember, we were made in the image of God. And God is a sender. He not only creates things, but He then imparts them sends them out. Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 and 28 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created it. Male, female, he created them. And God blessed them, and he said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and every other living thing that moves on the earth. God creates, he created everything. Let that sink in. We manipulate stuff, polish something, discard something else, but God creates. He makes everything out of nothing. And what He makes is purposeful. It's beautiful. It's pleasing. And it is the best possible representation of that thing. God created humankind, men and women, to bear his image and to project his perfect and purposeful nature upon all that he had created. Whether it was simply the, the naming of the births, uh, the bees, the flora, the fauna, or tending and caring for all that existed. We were sent out not merely to just vacation on the Mediterranean coast, but what? To care for the creation. Not as owners, but what? As managers, as stewards. To shepherd all that God had created. And he made us specifically for that purpose. Equipping us, imparting to us, not only his, his nature, but his spirit. And then sending us out. Now, we have to remember that the beginning point, the starting line, things were a lot easier for us in that regard. With the fall, with sin, came what? Came the curse. And the creation started fighting back. Talks about thistles and thorns and beasts now that as much as we're looking at them for a good meal, they're looking at us for the same. The creation pushes back as we pursue the role that God has given us. He never took that job away from us. It's just gotten a lot harder. But if anything, because of the curse that we littered the world with, it's all the more necessary that we be about God's business. If we can think about it, from Adam and Eve being sent out of the garden to be 
to Cain being sent off to the land of Nod. Our Creator God has always been sending His people. Even Noah was bottled up in a boat with at least two of every kind of animal, clean and unclean, and sent off. And the ancient people were each sent as their purpose required. We see it in the pages of Scripture. We know it to be true from the records of human history. There was a people in a land called Shinar. They, they had a, a leader who, again, convinced them to what? To stop spreading out, to stop going out, to stop leaving the place of comfort, to settle, to build a city, to be comfortable, to be uh, well-fed and, and protected. And God had no tolerance for that whatsoever. He gave us the gift of language, thank you very much. He made it impossible for us, if we were not going to obey in unity, he at least made it impossible for us to collaborate in rebellion. And so the people, once again, went out again. And when God called a covenant people, people who would be identified by his name, Identified by being obedient and faithful, he identified them first by what? Sending them. We see in Genesis chapter 12, the patriarch of the worshipers of Jehovah God, a man by the name of Abram, who is identified, his first interaction that we see in the pages of Scripture is what? It's a sending. It says in verse 1 of Genesis 12, The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. So, what? Abram is going to go, he will be blessed, and in turn, he will become what? A blessing. This is the most ancient equation for people out for God that you can look at. And yet it is still relevant and real to this day. He said, I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And you, in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Of course, Abram is the patriarch of whom? Of the Israelites. And by extension, of us who follow Christ Jesus. Hebrews 11, verses 8 and 9 say that by faith Abraham, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. Now there's been plenty of times I've gone out not knowing where I was going, but that was not God's calling, that was my ignorance. Abraham followed God in faith. And maybe he didn't know exactly the route that God would take him down, but he knew where he was going. He was going where God was. And he moved at God's pace, and he lived by God's seasons. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same crop. You see, often... We see that when God sends us, even the journey itself, the journey that we experience and undertake, is part of the equipping, part of the calling. It may not seem like it when you're at home and you're comfortable and you're surrounded by your wealth and uh, your family and all your friends. You're like, hey, can't I just kind of go out and do this for a couple of weeks and call it a go? You go when God calls, you go where God calls, and you continue going until God tells you to stop. That's how this works. Make that your way of life. And so for Abram and Sarah, it would be long years before their calling would actually be manifest in what? In the birth of Isaac, who would be born to them in their old age. Isaac himself would have two sons. Esau and Jacob. And for Jacob, it would be many long seasons working under the sun of, in a foreign land for his uncle before he would be named Israel and manifest his calling. 
And for the Israelites themselves, it would be centuries of enslavement and then a 40-year march before they would occupy God's promised land. And so it is that when God sends you, He doesn't send you with an itinerary. Your estimated time of arrival, your in-flight meal will be, no, it is go and keep going until I say stop. And sometimes that stop is a matter of days, sometimes that stop is a matter of years, and sometimes that stop is a matter of generations. We keep going nonetheless. Any soldier, any first responder will tell you that the bigger the job often requires what? A longer season of preparation. And if so, if you have been following the Lord, if you have been answering His calling, and you don't feel you've arrived yet, it probably means that there's something to be in store. And you need to stay at your training. Leaving the familiar and the comfortable behind, we need to be strengthened, galvanized for God's purposes. And as it is for his people, so it was for his only Son, Christ Jesus, who is our Savior that was similarly sent. John chapter 6, the Lord Jesus described himself in this way. He says, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given to me, but raise it upon the last day. Just in John's Gospel alone, over 20 times, Jesus describes himself, or is described, as being the one sent from the Father. He left a place of comfort. He left a place where he is continually and eternally adored to enter a world that did not uh, like him, did not anticipate him, certainly did not respect him, and offered him nothing but danger and hardship his entire life. John the Baptist is also similarly described as what? Being sent. To become part of the entourage of the Messiah. And so, as we are blessed by their respective ministries, it imparts to us what? A duty. You ever like the, uh, uh, the, the old, uh, I call them cowboy and western movies? That's not how old I am. But yeah, the, the old westerns. And a repeated theme from the old ones, including the, uh, the more modern ones, is this. A town is besieged by evil bad guys. Picture what the bad guys look like in your mind. And a good-natured gunfighter comes into town. Immediately the town, they go, our Savior. And the good-natured gunfighter looks around and he's like, you people are pathetic. There's like four of them and 90 of you. And you all have guns. What's going on here? So what he has to do is what? He has to kind of get them worked up. It's like, yeah, it's going to be dangerous. It's a gunfight. Gun Gunfights are dangerous by, by design. But you've got this. And so they need to find their, their inner lion, and, and they stop after being sheep, and they, they go out and they fight, Woo! and then the, the gunfighter rides off. I always envisioned the gospel sort of in that mindset when I was little. You know, Jesus was the one who came in and says, no, you've got everything. You just need to start using it. You just need to start standing up and acting like you've been saved, not like you're being trampled upon. So it is that at the apex of Jesus' earthly ministry, he calls his own to him, he equips them, he trains them, gives, us, gives them a few practice runs, and then what? He sends them out. As I was sent, so I am sending you. 
Uh, John 20, verses 20 through 22, he said this. He showed them his hands and his side. He said, this is what I was willing to suffer for you. I didn't do this just for dramatic sake. I got a blister on my hand in the garden. So I don't think I'm a hero for the cross. But yeah, he showed them. This is what being sent costs you. He didn't sugarcoat it. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you, and as the Father sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he said this, he breathed on them, and he said, Receive the Holy Spirit. The same equation plays out for every believer ever since. The formula remains intact. What has broken is the faith and the faithfulness of those who dare to call themselves Christ's followers and yet disobedient to his teachings. Acts, or I'm sorry, Matthew 28, verses 19 through 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. <coughs> Acts 1 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. He doesn't say you might be, he doesn't say you could be, he couldn't say consider be. He said you will be. If you are a follower of me, remember that whole produce fruits in accordance with repentance? put up or shut up kind of stuff. I think we've neglected a lot of that. There's a difference between being a comfortable church and a sending church. We all dream of great things. I don't know any Sunday or any congregation that's meeting around the world today that thinks of themselves as a failure of the kingdom. Perhaps we've just gotten a little too comfortable. I like being comfortable. I like those chairs. Those chairs are really comfortable compared to uh, the wooden pews that we had before. Rodrigo sat in those pews before they even had cushions on. Were those pews comfortable? Oh no. And maybe that's the problem. Maybe, maybe we've made this place a little too comfortable. I've got an 85 inch TV up there. An 85 inch TV. Can you imagine that? I remember the first time I went to a church where they, they wheeled out one of those little AV cards and it had like a, uh, just a dinky little TV and we're all squinting watching this missionary video movie and we thought like we're getting away with something because we had a TV in the church. You like being comfortable. God. But that's not what we're meant for. That's not what our purpose in life is. We need a Sabbath rest on occasion. We need to celebrate on occasion. We need to, to have uh, places where we can go and, and shelter and rejoice. God, all that. But we've got work to do. And if we focus on the, the comfort, we lose not only our purpose, but we lose our identity. Eagles, and I'll close with this. Eagles are massive raptors. Uh, if you've ever seen like a bald eagle's uh, uh, claw, their claw is about as big as a man's hand. Think of that. That's a honking big, big bird. Eagles uh, build their nests typically on whatever the highest thing is in the area that will allow them a vision of, of everything going on. It allows them to see their prey from a long ways away, while at the same time being protected from uh, uh, predators that would, would uh, harm them in their Eagles' nests are oftentimes constructed of large sticks. Sometimes they'll pick up random sticks and uh, bring them up. But a lot of times, picture this, an eagle with his beak, almost like a, uh, what do you uh, call those, lopping nest shears, will go over and lop off branches and bring them back to the, uh, to the nest. They build these massive structures that are amazingly strong, but they're also really pointy because of all the sticks. So what do they do? Well, they take animal pelts, they take moss, they take grass, anything they can to kind of line it. Because if you just dropped an egg, a big heavy eagle's egg, into one of those uh, nests with the pointy sticks, what would happen? It would break. It would be a mess. Now they need eagles. 
And then finally, the last thing they do before the eagles are hatched, oftentimes it's the females, but both males and females have been seen to do this, they will pull out their own feathers. They will pull out their own feathers. It's got to be painful. And that's the final line. The eagles are hatched. They eat. They're initially, they're completely dependent on mom and dad to go out and, and uh, get them food. But after just a few months, they start flexing their, uh, their stuff. They, their wings start developing. They do like practice flying in the nest. And by about 10 weeks, Mama Eagle will start doing something that seems kind of counterintuitive. All the feathers that she plucked out of her own body, all of the animal pelts, all the moss, all the grass, she starts pulling it out and throwing it over the edge. It's called unfeathering the nest. And before long, the nest goes back to being what again? Nothing but pointy sticks. Why? Because they know that if, if, if it is too comfortable, the baby eagles will never learn to fly. And the baby eagles, the, they see their parents, they're up in the sky, and you can picture them. They're wheeling in large arcs over the nest, and they're calling to the babies, leave the nest, leave the nest, leave the nest. And then they spread their wings, and they drop, and it's awkward, it's always a, a a breathtaking moment the first time they step over the edge and you're like, oh, this baby is doomed. And then they get it. Because by instinct, they knew, know who they are, they know what they are, they are eagles. And they join their parents in the sky and they never go back to the nest again. Beloved, God has something better for you than this. You may not have it by instinct, but the Spirit is speaking to us now. And He's saying, I have made you to go out, to leave your place of comfort, to introduce the kingdom of God, to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, to be blessed and to be a blessing. Today, we've got three young folks here who are taking their next step on their journey. And we have to send them in a manner that is worthy yeah. of their calling. Now for Rich Crest, we have to know who we are. And we are a church founded not by Southern Baptist Ministries, founded by Christ Jesus Himself. And we have a purpose. It is a simple purpose. The purpose of Rich Crest Baptist Church is to plant churches that will plant churches. Nothing more difficult, nothing more complicated than that. But for 60 years, we have not lived up to that purpose. We've been too busy making a nice place. It's time to unfeather the nest. And we have young people that we are sending out. And their purpose is the purpose of every follower of Jesus Christ. To make disciples who will make disciples. Whether it's on campus, whether it's in a hospital, an office building, at the kitchen table, at the grocery store, your purpose is to make disciples. It doesn't matter how you earn your money, it doesn't matter how you pay your bills, your purpose is not established by your employer. Your purpose is established by your creator. This world is not your home. We travel it for a season and then we're gone. But it is your mission to be. And I believe Jesus is calling each of us, not someday, but here and now, to start taking that mission seriously. And he promises to be with you every step. Father in heaven, we do thank you. We thank you, Lord, for your faith in us. You have given us, Father God, perhaps the most difficult and yet the most rewarding, the most blessed job there is. To proclaim the gospel, to present the kingdom, 
and to live like saved people for the world to see. Father God, we have not been about your business. We get distracted, we get tired, we get worried and scared. And so we need your spirit, Father God. Courage for wisdom, for focus, for initiative. And we need companions along the way. Some for the entirety of the journey, some just only for our short way. But most of all, we need you with us, guiding us, propelling us, and waiting for us at the finish line. Let us be about your business. And as we pray in Jesus' name. Thanks, we have the us. We have both of us. Please stand for number 577, the old ship is by it. We'll do all five verses to the traffic. Are you kidding me? No. Five oh, verses. We, we, okay, so the last time we left off, for it was good for my dear mother. Well, maybe we're wondering, but all the other family. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough.